Trial Tuesday. It is Trial Tuesday. Once again, FSU star quarterback and Heisman Trophy winner Jameis Winston been in the news a lot lately. Joining us to talk about the latest on his legal situation is attorney and our courtroom quarterback, David Ayler. Counselor, thanks so much for being here. Of course, we follow this. It's on ESPN. It's in the papers in the sports section each and every day. Tell us about where the investigation is right now. And important to note that Jameis Winston still has not been charged with a crime. And, and that's what's the confusing part is to most people that are just looking at it from the public for a sec. Essentially, he was uh, alleged to have committed a sexual assault back in 2012. Uh, that investigation was done by the Florida State Police uh, as well as the district attorney's office there in Florida. Ultimately, they determined that they were not going to bring any charges. And that means that it's not a situation where he's found not guilty. They never actually bring any charges at all. So at that point, he's clear. Outside of any new evidence coming, uh, which is usually not the case, Mm -hmm. uh, the case is completely closed. However, within the school system, uh, any college or university, both public or private, uh, they have a code of conduct. Uh, this code of conduct would include everything uh, from, uh, you know, cheating on your papers to uh, drugs on campus, that sort of thing. But it also can incl include serious crimes. And if it's a violation of the code of conduct within the school, they can actually go through a process and then uh, punish you within the school, even though you may not ever have been criminally charged. Different schools have different disciplinary measures, of course. Uh, some have an honor council, some have a board of directors, board of trustees that would oversee these disciplinary actions. How does it difference, uh, differentiate there between you know those two things, a student or peer-led disciplinary council versus uh, somebody higher up in the chain? Usually you're going to see a little bit of a combination of both. Some just have faculty or staff involved. Some have a hybrid of both uh, the honor board, like what you're talking about, yeah. students, uh, and then also some member of the faculty or staff or a dean. Uh, when it's more serious stuff, you're almost always going to see a dean uh, get involved simply because what the penalties are, which can be, you know, expulsion, uh, suspension. But what's important to understand when you have charges like Jameis Winston would be facing through the code of conduct, he may be completely innocent as far as the courts are concerned. Uh, but if he's found guilty or responsible for a violation of the code, a sexual assault under Title IX, that then goes on his permanent record for the rest of his college career. And I know from dealing with a lot of these cases, both here locally and outside of the area, you know, that's the type of thing that can stain someone from being able to get into any other school, even even though they never actually went through a justice system. They literally just went through an internal school system based off the Title IX. Well, a as a lawyer yourself, what do you think that his lawyers are thinking right now? Like, the, you know, they're saying that this man's not been charged with any crime yet, that he could still face expulsion from Florida State University if it did come down to that and that disciplinary measure went through. So the lawyer in this case has to say, well, wait a minute, guys. I mean, you can't do this. The guy never got charged with a crime in the first place. It's very frustrating from the standpoint of a lawyer, and I can speak from personal experience in this, but the way that it works through the school process and with uh, Title IX, I understand Title IX is a federal policy that's put in place uh, to create a number of different things within uh, the campus environment. Of course, first and foremost being equality um, and then following under those standards. So that's what they put the code of conduct within. However, the problem is, from a standpoint from an attorney, they're often not involved at all or very little within this process, yet the person who's sort of on trial, if you will, for these conduct violations can be found, you know, responsible for them yeah. without any legal representation, and then that fall on beyond. I mean, just imagine if James Winston was found responsible for something that the, the, the pr true professionals, the district attorney's office, the of police, did not even bring charges for him against, but then he was, you know, expelled from school. And what about the victim in this case, or the alleged victim, we should say? say because it seems like there are a lot of changes in her story as a lawyer yourself would you go after her and kind of do a, a character uh, a, I guess you know uh, focus on that and make sure that you try and disprove her in a court of law yeah that's what you try to do in these situations when you're handcuffed like most lawyers are within the code of conduct policy or the title nine investigations you'd have to run things literally through your client themselves so you really work in the background roles an attorney uh, trying to assist them in whatever you can through the process um, and that's really all you can do but yes exactly looking at the credibility of the person that's involved that plays a lot on whether or not to charge comes in the first place and definitely should play in the school investigation which coming up probably this week all right well we'll have to keep an eye on that one attorney dave miller thank you for your time sir thanks for Do having appreciate me. it as always much more low country live coming up after the break stay with us trial tuesday brought to you by attorney david ayler